الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Safina Society podcast and we have a unique episode today on uh, da'wah right, in a, to a, a, a population that we oftentimes uh, don't really look at and sometimes they're like the token uh, Muslims in the masajid and that is namely uh, with our guest Rob Dufour and he's got a podcast of his own called Islam for Europeans. So we're looking today at da'wah. Uh, to Europeans, and what does that entail? What are some of the stories about that? Our guest today, Rob, is from Canada. He's originally French-Canadian, uh, but he lives now in London, Ontario. So welcome to our podcast, Rob. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, my name is Robert, uh, and our, our um, channel is called Islam for Europeans, the number four uh, in the middle. Uh, and yeah, um, Je- we're going to talk to you today about our alternative solution uh, to uh, giving dawah to not just Europeans, but uh, Muslim or I'm sorry, non-Muslims uh, from from any background um, where I guess um, Muslims might be the minority or it's generally considered that these people um, are, are generally considered a non-Muslim population. Yeah. Okay. So we're not being exclusive uh, to other groups uh, in any way. But what we're suggesting uh, is twofold. And we believe that this is going to have benefits uh, for not just uh, converts from a European background, but converts uh, from all backgrounds and also Muslims from all backgrounds, especially Muslims living in the West, also for non-Muslim populations um, and uh, the ongoing 1300 year conflict between Islam and Europe, all for a fraction of the price uh, <laughs> so no, no small task, uh, but we feel that these solutions have gotten a lot of support from people from all sorts of walks of life. Um, Muslims that you would uh, originally associate with the political left, uh, Muslims who would you uh, originally associate with the political right, uh, those on the center, those from religious backgrounds, those from non-religious backgrounds, and also uh, the converts themselves, their families, their communities, and also the society in general. So yeah, piece of cake. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, uh, I had asked you for some, you know, to, to prepare some stories of your experiences, but I think the most important one is your own experience because yeah. that's the one that you have the most detail and color and your whole journey to it has informed how you're gonna uh, approach, you know, uh, your dawah. So why don't, why don't we start with that? Absolutely. So yeah, this realization took uh, several years. I converted to uh, Islam in 2003. Um, But going way back uh, to my early life, I was born in 1981 in a small town outside of Windsor, Ontario called Amherstburg. Um, Amherstburg is a a town that's 95% white, uh, mostly French and Italian uh, backgrounds there. Uh, So it was a predominantly uh, Catholic uh, town. I was raised uh, by my mother and father, and I lived with my one brother. Uh, my father was a stand-up comedian. Oh, uh, he was of uh, uh, French, uh, Ontar- uh, Franco-Ontarian descent, uh, but he had lost all his French uh, when he uh, entered a, an English school. Uh, my mother uh, r- uh, took care of me and my brother, and uh, also uh, she was the one who managed uh, our comedy club. So they had a bar comedy club in Windsor, Ontario um, for several years. I went to a Catholic uh, high school and grade school, um, but my family were never really practicing uh, Catholics. They were more, I guess, cultural Catholics. They didn't really uh, practice the faith. But uh, uh, even from an early age, I was always interested in uh, religions in general, especially when I entered high school. I know we, me and my friends would always have philosophical discussions. What's the meaning of this life? Why are we here? Is it all a dream? Uh, So it was very latent uh, in my mind, but a couple of of experiences really stood out during that time. Uh, We had actually uh, gone on a field trip, a grade 10 field trip to different uh, religious uh, places of worship. And one of the places was the mosque, the local mosque in Windsor, where I would end up taking my Shahada seven years later. Uh, So that was an early experience into that. And I I wanted to ask, uh, you know, a question actually to the lady who was, you know, uh, giving us the tour. Um, and the question revolved around, do Muslims believe in a day of judgment? I don't know why that question popped in my head, but I never had the guts really to, to say anything because I didn't want to stand out in the crowd. Um, 
So after I left uh, high school, I really didn't have any direction in my life. Uh, I was still living with my family. Uh, I only had a part-time job. I didn't pursue post-secondary education. I didn't have a girlfriend or a wife. So my life was pretty much uh, flying by and just going down the drain. So I had really no direction in my life. Uh, cue ahead to 9-11, uh, events of September 11th. And that really you know, jarred everybody's memory, created all these negative images of, uh, of Islam and Muslims. Uh, but then a couple of weeks later, I started to look into the internet because I was very deeply, heavily into conspiracy theories. And I'm not going to get too deeply into that, but uh, I had a very inquisitive mind into looking into uh, why are these events happening in the world? Um, you know, uh, what's the whole cause behind it? Uh, and, and why are we here on this planet as a larger question? Eventually, uh, my curiosity uh, turned to Islam because it was big in the media. Uh, the Iraq war was happening. And Islam was very prominent in, in, the, in the media and whatnot. So I typed up ISLAM on Google one night all alone uh, in my house. And lo and behold, the first website I went to had a picture of an unborn baby in the mother's womb. And I thought to myself, is, is, do I have the right website? Is this Islam? <laughs> so as I looked into it, I, you know, it explained that uh, the Quran has many amazing things that were written back in the seventh century that we're only uh, finding out now with the technology of the 20th century. So this absolutely floored me because, you know, when I was growing up in, in high school and uh, going to high school, you know, the, the message was always, you can never prove that God exists. Uh, you know, it's, you know, and, and since you can't prove God exists, what's the point of following a religion? You know, uh, what's the point of this life? And no one's ever going to find out the truth. But uh, by the grace of Allah, uh, Allah opened up my heart to read more and more about Islam. Uh, so I studied Islam on my own for about uh, seven, eight months. I didn't tell anybody about it, not even my bosses, who are also Muslim, uh, until I um, one day decided to go to the same mosque that I went to uh, years ago in high school. And this was during Ramadan, actually. So I, I, was, uh, I, was, I fasted a few days during Ramadan. Uh, before I went there. But the first two times that I went, I was absolutely terrified. I didn't want to go there. I didn't feel like I didn't know if they would accept me. And I didn't know if I wanted to make uh, that actual jump to either convert to Islam or even converse with another Muslim. I even went to chapters, I remember a couple, uh, a couple months before I converted. And I was even um, looking at the, the section of religions and I saw the Quran, uh, translation of the Quran there, but I didn't actually didn't even have the guts to buy it. Uh, because I was thinking, you know, what would the cashier think? So this was, you know, I, again, I was not a very brave person, but, uh, you know, gently Allah guided me to that mosque uh, in November and ended up taking my Shahada. And from there on, uh, things just, uh, in my life just started to unfold. I told my family a week later and, uh, Alhamdulillah, they were very accepting about it. My dad actually shook my hand when I told him that I converted to Islam. Uh, my mom was accepting of it. Um, and back in 2003, the mosque was a very uh, accepting, warm, integrated uh, community. Uh, and I noticed that uh, you had people from all different walks of life there. Uh, so, yeah. And so it was at the time, you know, I spent my first three, four years uh, learning what I could about Islam. Excuse me, my cat is going to uh, break my internet connection right now. So I got to be very careful here so it doesn't get cut off. Come on, kitty. Okay. Inshallah. That is a nice little thing. Why is that like less than a year old, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. That was Mo. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so anyway, okay. We still got the internet connection. Good. Okay. That's, that's the only guy who's allowed to be called Mo. <laughs> <laughs> this, actually, it's still form for Mo. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. So anyway, um, um, where was I? Okay. So um, yeah. So we, I saw dozens of people from different nationalities. And what I noticed was that um, a few things. Uh, one is that in Windsor is a very multicultural society. So even though, you know, we saw all different walks of life when we went to Juma prayer, I saw um, Somalis having a distinct culture, their own restaurants, their own organization, uh, their own get togethers, their own uh, language, their own culture. Uh, the Pakistani community was big in, in Windsor as well. Uh, the Turkish uh, community had their own uh, cultural center just outside of Windsor. Uh, the Arab community, uh, they had their own organizations based on, uh, on country as well. So there's a Syrian organization in Windsor. So, but at the same time, all of them, you know, still went for Juma prayer. We all saw them on Eid. But what I was seeing is that, um, you know, they were trying to acclimate new converts. And while they were trying to do that, 
you, we were noticing several things and that one, there were some converts who were very strong and ended up, you know, like becoming very highly practicing and kind of become the golden children of the community. And that's basically what I was. I dived right in, you know, I, be, I made friends with whoever I could. And I basically, you know, become, became kind of this, um, you know, token uh, white spokesperson for the Muslim community. But I also was seeing that many converts were falling through the cracks. Um, it was difficult for them to get uh, adjusted. Uh, many of them had uh, negative experiences at the mosque, and many just felt like they did not simply fit in. Um, so skip ahead, you know, my life started moving along. I uh, got married to another convert. Um, you know, I went back to university. Uh, you know, I, I started uh, making developments in my life. Um, and this is when I started to see uh, just how difficult it was for um, converts whose family had a negative experience with Islam. Okay, I don't want to get into too much detail because... I don't want to get too personal, um, but you know we saw many converts where um, you know they when they told their family they converted to Islam, their their father or their mother slapped them or beat them up, um, told them that if you wore hijab, you know you're not gonna we're not we're going to disown you, um, and just basically even myself I found out you know very clearly that when you convert to Islam, especially from a European background, you're basically living between two worlds, um, and this is what. Uh, we kind of noticed on the surface, and this feeling no more intensif uh, greatly intensified, I would say exponentially, uh, from about 2014 onwards when I entered to do my master's degree. Um, I know I'm talking a lot here. Do you guys want to yeah, chime keep, in with anything? Keep, no, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, good. Story's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, skip ahead to uh, 2014. I had gone through, uh, sadly, a divorce uh, to my uh, uh, wife, who was also a convert. Um, mm. But when I re-entered to do my master's degree, I noticed that um, you were see, we were seeing a very um, sharp schism uh, within uh, the Muslim community and particularly the Muslim youth. What we were finding is um, because of many events uh, that were happening, um, many Muslims were getting into political activism. And you saw this very intensely uh, for several reasons. One uh, was, uh, I guess, the 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 the, the BDS uh, movement uh, that are in popular in universities, and of course the election of Donald Trump. So this caused quite a divide in the Muslim community. You can see a very uh, sharp schism. You had one group uh, that was very uh, political. Uh, you can say many of them were not practicing, but not all. Some were also trying to practice their religion. And you could tell they felt very marginalized. Okay, and uh, these were, you know, like I said, the de the dean to them uh, was more of, of an identity marker than anything else, um, and and uh, they didn't feel like they fit in with the greater uh, Canadian society. And then the other side, and usually those kids ended up joining, you know, uh, nationalist uh, groups on campus, your Palestinian groups, uh, you know, the Pakistani groups, and and whatnot. The other side, you know, was more on the uh, the religious side. Um, they were, you know, taught tradition. Many of them, you know, were were practicing Muslims. They were learning traditional Islam. Uh, and this is where they had a split uh, with the, you know, more nationalistic, um, identitarian uh, side of of the Muslim coin. So me as a as a white convert of 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 ten twelve years, you know, this was very. I could start to see exactly why many uh, converts felt like they did not fit in. Okay. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some anecdotal stories, more anecdotal stories I can tell. I'm just talking about myself right now, and I'm going to branch off later to, you know, actual events. But the general consensus was uh, these more politi politicized, marginalized Muslims really had a lot of inner resentment towards Western society, uh, Western, civiliz Western civilization, and just basically white people in general. And I think this really intensified once they realized that uh, BDS was very almost impossible for them to have as a movement when they um, talked about specifically in, into, into, in terms of, of, of Israel or, or Zionism. Uh, so they tried to ally themselves with many other minority groups. And many of these um, uh, other groups had beliefs that were anathema to you know, uh, traditional uh, Islam. One of which is that, you know, this, this is a common thing that we hear that it's basically, impo it, it's impossible to be racist towards white people. So, you know, the, you know, practicing religious Muslims, you know, they were against this, you know, they said, you know, this is not going to be good for Dawah in the West. Uh, you know, this is not what Muslims believe. 
Um, and you can't denigrate an entire group of people like this. Okay, so, uh, so this caused a lot of friction between uh, the, the, the Muslim youth. And you could tell that uh, you know, it, you know, there was almost like no particular solution. And it wasn't an either or circumstance as well. You saw many of these youth, you know, they had brothers and sisters, actual brothers and sisters on one side, but they themselves were on the other side. Okay, um, so skip ahead, I finished my master's degree and, uh, you know, basically exited, uh, you know, the university and thus the political arena. You know, I entered the workforce and had a, a, a good job. Um, but still in the back of my head, I was thinking, it, this is where we're headed as a Muslim community because uh, many Muslims feel that they feel marginalized. Uh, they feel that they're being under attack by the society, which is totally understandably true. I mean, uh, you know, they're being, especially with the election of Donald Trump, um, you know, many of them feel that whenever they walk down the street, um, any white person is going to be a potential negative 100. They're going to be a potential Islamophobe. You know, they could potentially rip off my hijab at any moment. They could potentially uh, say a racial slur. And uh, this is what we're seeing, this increased polarization of, uh, of society. Uh, whereas converts, uh, you know, we're in a completely different situation. Okay. So for us, uh, you know, we're not visibly Muslim. So we don't know what those experiences are like. But at the same time, our family, uh, our community, our, our general society uh, is not Muslim. So for us, uh, I guess the, the threat for ours is more internal, whereas the, um, the, for, for, these born, for born Muslims, especially those who feel marginalized, their threat of Islamophobia is more external. And, not, and I'm saying this not to say that one is, is worse or better, uh, but I want to feel that we can move past this um, and say that, you know, instead of pointing figures and saying who has it worse or better, uh, propose a solution that is going to be uh, beneficial for all sides. So in 2019, uh, you know, we formed Islam for Europeans uh, we, with these general ideas in mind. And we're finding that uh, we're starting to get support uh, on all sides. Uh, so that, that's basically uh, my story uh, in a nutshell. Uh, I hope uh, that wasn't uh, too long or too short, but uh, hopefully we can expa expand on some of these, uh, you know, um, I guess these anecdotes or stories that I've saw that I've seen uh, in the Muslim community um, that, you know, sort of help me help us come to these conclusions. Okay. What's the solution then? Because I pretty much agree with your categorization of the active youth are either going to be more on the political side, more on the knowledge side. Right. The, you know, piety and knowledge and our moral standard come everything. Truth comes from Quran and Hadith first. Right. The political mm -hmm. side may adopt a different view. That's more of a, uh, you know, political paradigm in which that, you know, sometimes they don't have they're not all false. Uh, the ideas there mm -hmm. are all false, but they take up a larger space in their methodology and in their head than, let's say, the pietistic and knowledge track. OK. And so, I, yeah, that divide is there. And you find that certain converts are in the middle uh, or not in the middle. They're just they're, they don't actually, if anything, there there's there's more diversity in the piet in the knowledge and piety camp. Right. Mm -hmm. There's much, much more diversity there. But in any event, uh, so given that your premise is pretty much agreed upon mm -hmm. uh, that view, Alex, would you concur that pretty yeah, much? For sure. Yeah, that's the playing field. And you've described it pretty much accurately. Mm -hmm without denigrating anyone uh, mm. or misrepresenting them. So tell us about your solution. Yeah, so our solution is that um, uh, converts to Islam uh, who are from a European background, just as our African-American brothers and sisters and just as our Latino uh, brothers and sisters have done so in the past uh, with enormous success, um, is to um, collectivize and band together uh, into uh, sub-communities while still being an integral part of the Muslim community. You have to look at it uh, in a style of a Venn diagram. Okay, and again, this is a very, these are very, very delicate, delicate uh, topics um, because we don't want, like, um, I know the religious um, uh, side of the Muslims, uh, they're very afraid that this is going to descend into nationalism and that's not what we're suggesting. But what we are suggesting is that um, as converts of European background, uh, we have a responsibility uh, to lead the, the Dawa efforts um, to, to, this, to our families, to our communities. But that is almost impossible to do as a single person. 
So that's why we need to uh, form collectives and to focus our efforts on giving Dawa to our own people. And this is going to, and this is not a, uh, a zero sum game. And this, this is going to have benefits for the more political uh, side of the Muslims, because if you, if you ask them uh, what their uh, complaints are vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, white converts, um, they don't like the fact that we are appropriating other cultures. Uh, they have issues with us um, trying to become white saviors. Um, they feel that when a white person converts to Islam and enters the mosque environment, uh, we're given all these gifts, we're given all these high statuses, we're given all these marriage proposals. And it, it, instead of uh, accepting that and becoming this kind of tokenized uh, uh, white convert that is uh, coming to save the society, we're instead going to focus our, our, our efforts on giving dawah uh, to our own people. And they're also, one of their biggest uh, complaints is that, um, you know, uh, many people from European backgrounds who are not Muslims, they're the ones who are protesting at mosques. They're the ones uh, who are throwing pig's heads at mosques. They're the ones who are ripping the hijabs off our sisters. They're the ones spray, fading, spray painting uh, graffiti on our mosques. But what our suggestion would do is that um, these are our aunts, these are our uncles, these are our fathers, these are our mothers. These are the people that we play tennis with. And um, it, um, us more than ever have uh, a greater in, uh, more uh, social capital um, uh, with these people. And thus by, you know, not even if they don't accept Islam, if we can um, allay their fears uh, of Islam and uh, show them that Islam has many benefits uh, for mankind, this is going to, you know, uh, you know, these people are going to think, you know what, maybe I won't go to that mosque protest. Maybe I'm not going to get angry at Muslims. And that way we can do the best uh, uh, for our part uh, to lower Islamophobia in the West. And then if we look at the more of the, the religious side, I guess the more religious traditional Muslims, um, this has benefits for them as well. Uh, because when we look at mosques and organizations, Many of them only have a limited amount of funds to spend. And I'll dive into an anecdote here. We have, we, I remember there was one convert to Islam and, uh, you know, uh, he um, had been an alcoholic before and he was just uh, trying to, you know, uh, he found Islam and he wanted to dive right into it. And we were going on an Umrah trip and the imam of the mosque offered this guy a free Umrah trip two weeks into being Muslim. Okay. And this, this must have cost at least $3,000, right? So he went on the Umar trip and he just, he didn't know any of the monastic. He didn't know any of the rituals. He was in a completely different environment. And, you know, this guy was just uh, a fresh new convert. And after the whole experience was over, we never saw him again. Uh, until I found out later that he had, you know, went back to drinking alcohol again. And the, mo the Muslim community had just given him so much, uh, not just the Umar trip, but free gas cards, uh, to go to the mosque and all these, uh, um, you know, like uh, incentives. But he felt that he had let the Muslim community down because they were placing him on such a high pedestal and it was almost like setting him up for failure. Okay, um, so and that's that's just one anecdotal evidence as if we were to have a Muslim community, it would just be a lot more financially feasible. And just from a practical perspective, let's say, for example, if you have a lot of people converting to Islam en masse, let's say 100 people convert to Islam en masse in any city, mm -hmm. Muslim organizations, mosques, they simply do not have the resources uh, to house these people, especially if they're sisters, um, and spend all this money on them when they're, you know, they just, um, they have to spend money on other things as well. So this is a much more leaner model. What we're, you know, in our alternative solution, um, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, converts want, you know, they can, they have their own spaces, they have their own apartments, their own houses, you know, they can, uh, you know, have their own events where we don't need to rent, really rent out these things. Um, and another uh, point that I might, you know, point out is that um, you know, a lot of uh, mosques, you know, will try to have every single event at a mosque. Okay, so in their head, because in their head, they think, you know, every, if we have it at the mosque, there'll be more baraka in it, there's more angels here. And, uh, you know, any uh, thing outside the mosque is sort of, you know, like, uh, you know, um, you know, there's things there that are haram. Um, so in their mind, they think, you know, we built this, this is our space, and let's have the solution for everything at the mosque. But for converts, especially converts for a European background, 
Um, many of us are hiding our Islam uh, from our family um, and they don't feel comfortable going to a mosque because they don't want to be found out. Um, and some of them just don't feel uh, comfortable uh, going there. Um, so, you know, having events off mosque is definitely more important. And really, when a lot of us convert to Islam, the main goal is many of our family and our community members, um, you know, they have varied reactions when we convert to Islam. And I'm going to use a scale of plus 100 to minus 100. So minus 100 is like your total uh, Islam hater, like a Robert Spencer. Plus 100 is like someone who's really, really positive about Islam. Okay, so when someone converts to Islam, you have all these varied reactions. Some are a minus 100, some are a minus 50, some are at zero, some are a plus 50, some are a plus 100. Many of them just do not feel comfortable going to a mosque or any type of Muslim environment. Even my father, when I converted to Islam, he, would, he had a very positive image of Islam to begin with. But it took me years for him to actually drag him to a mosque uh, environment. So even if, you know, for most uh, our family members, it's very, very difficult to even for, even for them to even come to a mosque or any type of Muslim environment. And in our alter alternative solution, uh, you know, we're going to provide an alternative where uh, if they don't feel comfortable going to a mosque, you know, you're going to network with other uh, converts, particularly those of European descent. But again, any convert from any from any background where they may feel comfortable with, where you can actually have those conversations and establish those relationships with those people, and then you'll gradually uh, help them allay their fears about Islam. So that's my long-winded response for those two particular groups, but there are other stakeholders. <laughs> yeah, so, so in, in essence, your, uh, your model is more like the Islam and Spanish model, right? Yes. Is that something along those lines? Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and, and then look at the enormous success that, they, that they've had because they realize that, you know, we have a lot of commonalities, converts of European descent and, uh, and converts who are Latino or Latina, because a lot of their families are very heavily religious, especially uh, in the West. So a lot of them had a lot of fears about Islam, you know, and they didn't feel comfortable going to a mosque. But if they're talking to, you know, other people who are Muslim, who are, you know, uh, Mexican background or Puerto Rican background, uh, you know, they feel more comfortable because they, again, they also speak the language. And that's an important part too, you know, and in languages, it's, you know, if you want to talk to someone's heart, you speak to them in their tongue, right? And uh, that's one example uh, in which Islam and Spanish has been successful. And another thing that Islam and Spanish has done is that they've created a positive um, Latino or Latina Muslim identity, right? So they're always referring back to Andalus. They're always referring to, back to the fact that Arabic and Spanish have many uh, cognates, yeah. right? So for them, this gives them more of a safety net uh, and feeling that they do uh, belong, okay? So, you know, uh, and, and this has helped a lot of people keep their Islam. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to us, you know, we're, you know, and it, it, again, it's, it's, it's right in front of us. Islam is um, Europeans, white people, the West are generally seen as, seen as the antithesis uh, to Islam. And we see this a lot. I mean, we see uh, Muslim spokespeople saying that, you know, basically using uh, the terms white or Western uh, or European as antonyms to Islam or Muslims or being synonymous with non-Muslim. And, you know, and again, it's, it's, it's not that they're, uh, they're intentionally doing it, but you see, you know, a lot of Muslims liking social media posts such as these, and no one's really questioning it. Right. So, and again, I can understand where they're coming from. I mean, you know, we know that there's a lot of animosity between uh, uh, the West and Islam. Uh, but I guess I mean, that's our... nice of you. I can't. <laughs> that's nice of you to say, but I really don't understand where it comes from. I don't. I have. I think it's a completely inexcusable. Well, Sorry it, to interrupt you. Well, yeah. I mean, again, and that's there are people who believe that. Uh, the way again, I'm the the front man of this organization. Sure. People are going to believe different things about it. Um, you know, when uh, people bring it up, you know, I like to say that it's an internal discussion. Uh, and for <laughs> me, and that you know just lets people yeah. talk about those things. And again, I mean, people are going, you could say that it's unacceptable. I mean, it certainly doesn't, then doesn't help us. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, and that's why, you know, we need to, I guess, um, I don't know. I don't like to get involved in it too much. 
Uh, you know, I used to, and then, you know, I just thought, okay, my blood pressure is getting way too high. <laughs> and if I keep talking about it, I'm going to have a heart attack. Before <laughs> I can well, you know, one of the, re one of the reasons that I brought, that I mentioned the Islam and Spanish model is because, um, the other, the other group that you mentioned, African Americans, um, their, their, their communities, their sense of community kind of grew up more organically. Right. So it was just that there was a lot of people, African Americans converting to Islam, especially in the sixties and seventies. Mm -hmm. um, some of it through the Nation of Islam, but some of it directly to Sunni Islam. Mm -hmm. And I mean, their communities grew up just simply because they lived in uh, in communities that were mainly divided along race lines. Yep. So, yeah. you know, you set up a masjid, it's going to be in your neighborhood and everybody, all the Muslims in your area are going to go to it. Mm -hmm. And so they're all going to be people from the, from the neighborhood. And if the neighborhoods are racially divided, that's what you're going to end up. Like where you said that you were that you grew up, the town that you grew up in, if uh, somebody started a mosque there because there was, you know, a dozen or two dozen or, you know, 50 Muslims, you'd all end up being white Muslims because that's all that's in the town or that's the majority of what's in the town. Yeah, so there are ge geographic factors. And I guess the biggest macrocosm of this example would be Bosnia, right? So Bosnia is a European country. I mean, it's, I think, 70, at least 70% Muslim, but they're Europeans. And it's, it's generally seen as you know, the, the heartland of, of European uh, Muslims. So, you know, for us, I mean, it, again, it's a very delicate subject because, you know, um, the, uh, I guess the knee-jerk reaction um, to an alternative solution like this is that, you know, um, this is when you think of <laughs> white people collectivizing for any reason, it's going to end up bad for Muslims, right? So, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's one of the challenges that, that we're looking at. But, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of support from uh, many African-Americans. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they, they say, yeah, I mean, you know, you should be uh, giving dawah to, quote unquote, your people. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't work together. Um, you know, actually, Malcolm X mentioned this in the, his autobiography. And he didn't say it in the context of, of white people converting to Islam, because, uh, you know, I guess none of us had converted at that point. But he did say that that white people should form uh, all white groups and work on anti-racism in the white community. And we will give them full respect and we'll be working together, but we'll each be working on our own uh, communities. So. But, well, one of the things, the premises that you said here is that um, the summary is really like attracts like. And the Habayib from the Ba'adawi from Yemen. They travel so all throughout the world. It's like uh, certain countries are blessed with resources mm -hmm. and, and, you know, natural resources like Egypt and India. Those people tended to travel the least. People mm -hmm. used to come to their countries to, to migrate to their countries and no one ever left. Certain countries like Yemen were bereft of such natural resources. They mm -hmm. always had to travel to trade and, and they usually found those countries to be better. I mean, England's another example. England didn't have much going for it, so they wanted to leave, right? There are reasons they become explorers, et cetera, so it's much more attractive uh, other parts of the world. So Yemenis travel to Western India. Yemenis travel uh, to Indonesia, Malaysia. They travel to East Africa, and now they travel all over the world now that they're, you know, the transportation is different, but they travel for trade and Dawa. They intermarry more than anyone else. Right. So you go to East Africa and there's a whole uh, half Yemeni, half African, you know, type of person where it's like millions. Right. Indonesia, they call them Arab Malay, uh, Malaysia, Arab Malays. Right. Mm -hmm. Western India, same thing. So but interestingly, and everyone thought that the Badawi, they came to America, they're going to promote intermarriage. Well, one of the Badawi and that's and, and obviously it's totally fine in Islam, but no one expected one of the Habayib when he was in America doing Dawah, when he was asked about marriage, he actually gave the answer no one expected. And he said, look, uh, you here are in a setting that was different from what we you saw in the history books. And he said, your setting is very challenging. So I recommend you decrease the number of differences between you. Right. So everyone expected him to say the opposite because that's the history of the battle. He actually said, decrease the number of differences between you so there you have less opportunities to clash or reasons to clash so he actually promoted that regarding marriage now the analogy being that in any situation when there are less factors that are different amongst people it just allows them to focus on the one factor which is at hand which is the theology or the religion itself right so 
your dad doesn't want to go into a mosque. It might not have anything to do with Islam, right? It has to do with culture, right? Actually, Denzel Washington talks about this a lot. He says so much about what's talked about. It may not actually be you know, even race. It's culture, right? So it's what people are used to. And it's jokes that they make to each other that you feel left out. They never intended to leave you out. You just don't get their joke, right? Or it's little, uh, you know, things like that. So it's culture. That's the premise. Now, the other point, so that's an agreed upon premise. The other point is that you have to give Dawa to them as an obligation. Not That's not even a strategy, right? Imam Haddad has a book, Dawa Temma. Everyone has to give Dawa to himself, his family, then his neighborhood, then his countrymen, right? Mm -hmm. His people. Then after you finish that, you may go out to another nationality and give them Dao, right? Mm -hmm. So you actually become obligated to do that. And it's not, not just a strategy. And it would be silly for you to leave your people who know you, et cetera, and then go give Dao to some other group. They don't even know you, right? And you don't know their culture. So that's uh, one thing. Now, what people think about it is really irrelevant honestly and even they don't have to it's nice that you actually um thought about you know how everyone benefits from it but you didn't even need to think about that from what i look the, the perspective i look at it this is your my obligation i have to give them down so that leads me to another question have you ever had any positive experiences flipping someone who was you know uh inspired to you know throw a pig's head at a mosque you know, maybe that's too extreme. Have you had, have you had a positive experience flipping or uh, someone like that? At least to not throw a pig's head at a mosque. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know? again, this took a lot of effort, but to, when you're in a, a marriage uh, in which your in-laws are opposed to Islam uh, and they don't want to hear about it, you know, they don't want to hear the word Islam. They don't want to see it. They just want it to be out of sight, out of mind. The only thing you can do is try to be, you know, uh, follow the sunnah and uh you know be the best person you could be and uh you know they will see that they had positive that uh that islam does have benefits uh uh for not just your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law but also you know the greater uh society that they belong to so even near the end when uh when it did when it when you know the the marriage itself fell apart uh they were asking me you know how was your umar trip i want to know more about it uh you know like it's really fascinating to hear about it and uh, yeah, I, I guess at the end of the day, I, I did my job, but it took a lot of, uh, of inching forward and uh, doing those those little things. So yeah, I mean that's but you know those those are ways that it can turn around. I also, you know, like um, yeah, I, I had an experience where you know one of the comedians at my parents' comedy club was telling jokes about Muslims, and uh, you know he was complaining about Muslims at the bar, and this was a good friend of my of my mom and dad. You know, and uh, uh, I mentioned this to my to my mom and dad that you know that he was doing this, and then my mom and dad was like, "No, no, no don't worry, we'll take care of it." And uh, you know, the next time I saw him, he he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything about, "Hey, I'm sorry, I said those things." He basically just shook my hand and said, "Hey, you know, hey, Rob, how's it going?" Right. So I could tell that you know that this, you know, that this was the you know that, that my family was was looking out for me in that regard. So. Yeah. It does happen, but again, uh, you know, in many of these situations, it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of patience and a lot of trying to be the best person that uh, that you can be, right? What's the day to day interaction that you have with that population that you uh, can say, like today, you know, we did this, you know, this week we did that? Do you have dinners? Do you have what's well the due, due to COVID? Absolutely nothing. But yeah. <laughs> so now we're into the online world. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, uh, you know, people's, you know, we're in the social media world, you know, where it's just the garbage dump of people's thoughts. Yeah. But um, we're seeing a schism, uh, I guess, within, um, I guess, nationalist uh, movements in which you're seeing, um, I guess, white people who are pro-Islam or at least inquisitive about Islam and those who are very anti-Islam. So it's very fascinating to see. Uh, even though you would think both of these groups, um, you know, are just they just hate Muslims and they just want them out of the West, um, you're starting to see an actual schism because the side that's more pro-Islam or more inquisitive about it, uh, you know, they see that Islam has solutions for the problems that that uh, that the West is facing: mm -hmm. alcohol abuse, pornography, 
uh, degeneracy, um, low birth rates, um, you know, individualism, liberalism, right? Um, and they see Islam as a strong bulwark uh, against those problems. The problem is that side is not getting any media attention. All of them has been canceled out. And the one, the more anti-Islam side, are, they're getting all of the media attention, right? So, um, and it, you know, so, you know, you have YouTubers like Stefan Molyneux and Milo Yiannopoulos, who just until recently were given a huge platform, were given all these, you know, all this money. And, you know, they're seen as sort of like the face of, uh, I, I guess, uh, of, I guess, white supremacy or, or MAGA or whatever you want to call it. And this in turn is making, is getting, I guess, Muslims to believe that every, you know, single white person has it in for Islam and Islam is their main antagonist. So, um, you know, again, these are very uh, controversial sh subjects, but it's interesting to see that, um, you know, they're starting to become inquisitive uh, about Islam. Mm. Um, so, but again, this is on the, this is in the back of our, of our minds right now. It's not our main focus um, because we don't want to get canceled. Yeah. <laughs> Do you deal with them? Do you talk to them? Do you, is there any dialogue open with that side? Because yes. I, I don't mean, want to name Yeah. Yeah, why um, close it off? I mean, if you could possibly talk, and we had just an example that a guy in in Eng in, in Europe sent Abdul Hakim Murad, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, may Allah preserve him, and all the work that he's doing, uh, an email. Mm -hmm. He wrote him back a book, basically, and that led to the man's conversion. Right? We've all seen this in the news. I can't remember his name. Right? But we've Joram all Joram van Klaffren. Yeah. Uh, we actually interviewed him at Mad Men Looks. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the idea of dialogue with these groups, uh, it, you're not, you're not, you know, consenting to what they're doing. You're just talking to see if there's going to be any opening and maybe right. defang them a little bit. That's success. They don't have to convert, just pull out their claws a little bit. And, and even if they, you know, they end up, you know, um, not changing their opinion on Islam per se, um, they have some of the same misconceptions about Islam uh, that the anti-Islam right has. Um, but the, the interesting thing about it is they, they take those anti-Islam things that are generally considered anti-Islam, and then they put a positive spin on it mm -hmm. for some reason, even though it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, like what? Give me an example. Oh, I mean, they'll say, um, um, let me see, I, I guess, like uh, saying that, uh, you know, like a, a, a wife should obey her husband, right? So the anti-Islam right, you know, they, they, they say this all the time, you know, or uh, things like uh, anything that just basically keeps women down. <laughs> uh, but again, they're not seeing the whole nuance. They don't understand the whole uh, perspective on Islam and the relationship between the wife and the husband. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the anti-Islam, right, they put another spin on it. They take the contrarian approach and say, yeah, that's going to lead to higher birth rates, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so uh, or the idea of coverture, right? So, you know, they take a very, uh, they look at the sort of like the, you know, the um, what's generally considered bad things about Islam. And then they put a positive spin on it without, mm -hmm. even without understanding the nuance. Uh, but again, our, our goal is to try to, you know, say, okay, um, yes. I mean, there, some of these are non-truths. Some of these are half truths. Uh, but, you know, let's give a little more, um, um, you know, like, uh, how do I say, like comprehensiveness with to what yeah. you see. And a lot of the times it's cultural, you know, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, cousin marriage is a reason why, you know, this uh, lowers the I, uh, lowers the IQ in the Muslim population, but at the same time, it increases ethnocentrism. And this is why they have such strong families. This is why they feel involved. This is why, you know, they have such, you know, um, strong communities. Yeah. Just so, ask him you know, who his doctor is, who's your cardiologist, right? <laughs> <laughs> and talk about IQ afterwards. <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, they, they look at it at ranges, though. So they look at it from a range perspective, right? right. Um, you know, so when it comes to cousin, cousin marriage, I mean, this is something that happens in some Muslim communities. Um, it's not a prerequisite to converting to Islam, you know, but uh, uh, again, at the same time, a lot of, go ahead. I said, imagine if it were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd, now, that'd, well, be a big, uh, that'd be a big barrier. Yeah. Now tell me what's their, what's their, their, their uh, what are they revolving around these groups? Just because if we can know what they revolve around, once that collapses, there's going to be a big opening, yeah. right? So they're, it's a racial group, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And they, you know, when every time I look at this, I sort of like shrug it off because the numbers, the 
statistics just indicate that you're going to you're losing that battle. So they're mm. fighting a losing battle. Mm. The youth could care less in my from my experience, like, you know, youth are there are, you know, more into pop culture and pop culture is preaching the opposite message, you know, diversity, mm. etc. So the guys who are in that world, they they're fighting a losing battle. Once that battle is lost, a lot of times people's identities and their hearts are are, are vacant. Right. Mm. You know, me, you know, I think when Trump lost, when he won, they got hope. When he lost, I think it's sort of back to that trajectory uh, downward in terms of, you know, their agenda. In the same way, the Soviet Union, when it collapsed, there were so many people who don't know what they believe. Mm. And I remember one of the things that uh, uh, Sayyid Hossein Nasser said in class, he said, we missed a huge Dawa opportunity, right, in the Soviet Union or mm. in Russia after the Soviet uh, states collapsed. Mm. So likewise, these guys are losing. A, they're, they're fighting a losing battle. Yeah, they know that. They know yeah. that. There's going to be an opening where there's a lot of these people are going to you know, not know what to believe. And that's the type of person that you're able to talk to. And that's the person who's going to be open to a new idea. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, I mean, their main contention with Islam is that uh, when I, if, you know, if I would actually choose it, it would cause a lot of, you know, turmoil in my life and my whole family community would be against it. Uh, but there's also the idea that I'm going to lose out on my culture. Right. So I'll be right. basically joining the enemy, you know, and I'm going to have to wear a thobe and eat biryani and, and, you know, like, uh, you know, marry into, uh, into a Muslim family. But, uh, you know, what we're proposing, you know, is that, uh, you know, especially for the Muslim youth, if we take this approach and, you know, again, uh, you know, whites, they're going to be caught between uh, two options, basically. And we want to provide a third option. Mm -hmm. So the first option is basically self-flagellation where they're joining, you know, the, you know, the minority groups and, you know, they're sort of um, rejecting uh, their identity uh, in order to gain kind of social capital and basically join the winning side. And this is why you see a lot of, uh, you know, like um, uh, whites on the left, especially in universities, you know, who are on the forefront of like, you know, um, you know, espousing group, espousing beliefs like, you know, Robin D'Angelo's white fragility, you know, saying that, uh, you know, you, you need to completely destroy yourself, destroy your community. Like it's been nothing but a, a, a disaster. And then you have the other extreme where they're going to join angry nationalist groups, whether that's going to be Republican groups like MAGA, or it's going to be like the more extreme, you know, like, uh, you know, white nationalist groups, KKK or whatever, because they're going to feel uh, threatened. So I guess for us to provide a third option is going to have to be right in, you know, um, going to be neither extreme, but it's going to be right in the middle is that look, you know, uh, you've converted to us. If you convert to Islam, all of your previous sins are forgiven. Um, and we want you to keep your identity, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, joining your own sub community, you know, you'll keep the slang, you'll keep the culture, you'll keep uh, everything about you only dropping the things that are, you know, not acceptable uh, in Islam, mm -hmm. right? And that, and in this way, uh, this will solve a lot of the, of the problems that they say that probably about 80% uh, of their complaints. So, you know, like their main issues are, you know, our people are dying out, you know, due to liberal nihilism, due to not having kids anymore, um, you know, um, you know, due to all these things, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and again, we see that, uh, you know, like our culture is dying out as well. Yeah. So, but again, they're, again, you're, you're not going to get everything out of this. And again, the Muslims are kind of in the same boat because, you know, uh, a lot of Muslims have visions that, you know, like we're going to reestablish the, the Khalifa, you know, like, uh, you know, like the whole Hizbah Tahrir, Tahrir crowd, you know, um, in, in a lot of the times you just have to realize that, you know what, um, we have to think practically, we have to think years down the road and realize that, you know, there are some things we're going to be able to accomplish, but not all of them. Okay. I mean, for, go ahead. Yeah, no, finish what you're saying on the no Yeah, I mean, their their main complaint is is mass immigration and demographic change. You know, I yeah. mean, like in Britain, for example, they say that, and it, it you know you can see the trends in 2050, like what the white British are going to be a minority in their own country. Well, wow. yeah, but, I mean, I, I think that this is Quran says that mulk or you know mo monarchy is a dula between civilizations. It's been 500 years, right? 
uh, the Sun King, you know, was, uh, you know, uh, shown the sun up. never sets over yeah. the British Empire. The British Empire. <laughs> it's been 500 years from when you go back to the Hungarians were the first, you know, rivals to the Ottomans that, that gave the Ottomans a headache. Mm-hmm. And then it shifted over Austrians, you know, over, 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 then British, then Americans, right? So they, it's going to end. Every Everything ends for everybody, right? Yep. So that's yeah, there's a, there's a book you can, there's a book, uh, I think a British guy wrote it. His name is Sir John Glubb. Yeah. And it's at the fate of empires. Yeah. And he basically deduced that uh, every empire goes to the exact same phase. You know, yeah. they start up, you know, they have great expansion and they expand so much that uh, they just become super weak. And then it just completely falls apart. And that's what we're seeing with the American empire as well. Yeah. It's just like a life cycle of civilizations. Exactly. Now, c- question for you. And you talked about this sort of third option that uh, is Islam, but it's at the same time, it's neither of those two other extremes. But the thing is that that's an abstraction. Is there a way for people to see that? For example, Mm -hmm. if you had like a place where people could come and eat every Friday night or something like that, where a random dude in uh, London, Ontario could pop in, you know, sit around with a bunch of other guys. He might not even know they're Muslim, right? Yeah. Well, he'll know they're Muslim, but it's not going to be, it doesn't have to be a talk, Mm -hmm. right? And this is our way of sort of doing dawah in a sense of like, it's slowly, it's like, oh, okay, those guys have been going to the, having dinner with them for like five years. Now I have a problem. Maybe they could help, right? Mm-hmm. Or I'm actually curious, right? So I think dawah is, the best way of dawah is that which is so sort of non dawah right? Mm-hmm. But you just become part of people's lives, right? And we have actually are witnessing it now that we have such a good uh you know, reaction, reputation uh, with the, in New Brunswick, with the predominantly Latino community, Hispanic community. And we're not even Hispanic. I mean, Alex, the only one here who's, he's not even like from Central America. He's from uh, Argentina and Spain originally, but we're, we're just Arabs and, and Daisies who are doing it. Mm-hmm. And we got great relations with them already as is. So imagine if we were, right, we should probably, you know, hire someone who is, from Central America, right, or mm-hmm. Mexico, as a Muslim, mm-hmm. and 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 just show up. That's it. Yeah. But uh, that's my vision of Dawa that I think is going to work. So, do you, before COVID, did you have some node like that where people could actually cross pollinate and talk and just see each other? Because I think that's where that's going to be far more than a theory, because they'll be able to see it with their own two eyes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to think here. You know, we have ideas about uh, where we could actually kind of do this sort of thing, because it, let's say, for example, if I had all this money and we didn't have COVID going on and I opened up, you know, like a, a center for Islam for Europeans here downtown, downtown London, 99 percent of the, the people going there are going to be, you know, most born Muslims, you yeah. know, because there's no mosque downtown. Right. So it, and it's, it's not that they're doing anything wrong. It's just that you know, the, the main goal that we're trying to achieve is not going to be reached. Um, an alternative suggestion that I was thinking of, and this is, it's going to take some time, but especially in Canada, a lot of these European clubs are just dying out, you know, like they just can't pay the bills. Um, you know, and a lot of some European, and I, you have to look at the European countries that I guess are, are the most pro Islam, uh, among the list. So your Irish club, your German club, the Swedish club, the Dutch club, You know, uh, that might be uh, a place to start, not to say, you know, you know, we want to, uh, you know, turn into a mosque, but even just to have an event, you know, even if it's for a wedding, yeah, you know, and then have like a non-alcoholic wedding at those places. Uh, And and then that might be an option uh, to have. And then even just, or just having, let us come in and, uh, you know, and uh, give a talk, you know, uh, on Islam. Uh, And, you know, I think that might be a place to start. Uh, but again, actually go offer free cardiologic, you know, you know, medical, anything like non not Islamic, because you want to take the focus off of that and let you know that there are some stars that you can only see them from the corner of your eye. Hmm. But if you look at them, you can't see them anymore. That's what it needs to be because it's too much. It's almost like this is a too heavy of a topic. It's too. But if it hmm. oh, it happens to be a Muslim, hmm. right? Then at that point, I feel that it it there's more of an effect. 
right? Mm -hmm. And there's got to be sometimes you can have a center where the born Muslims show up the most, but if the leadership and the predominant people who are running the operation are of a certain culture, you will attract a lot of those people. Yeah. And we have Allentown, you know, to an hour away from us where it's predominantly Pakistan, if I'm not mistaken. But the percentage of whites, because the leadership are whites, Sheikh mm -hmm. Yahya, and um, he has, you know, the, the top guys with him are whites, right? And mm -hmm. I don't think that he... he uh, you know, I think they just happen to be whites, right? Mm -hmm. They're the guys who accepted the job right away. And there was a time where there were, th it was Sheikh Yahya and two supporters, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them was a white guy, one of them was an Afghani guy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not something that he purposely chose that, but uh, it, it's, a comf it's, it's a place where people who are white will relate more, right? It's just common sense because they see the leadership there is white, even though the majority of people are not white. So even though you may have that issue where all the born Muslims come in, but you'll still attain your objective, I think, you know, I'm just trying to think here of ways in which there's regular cross pollination with actual human beings. Yeah. The, th the thing is, uh, you know, when, when we look at every single uh, Muslim uh, community that's 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 come to the West, yeah. they have a very a visible sub community. Right. Uh, and they they have again, they've kept their own culture, they've kept their own spaces, they kept their own organizations, and they, they also have their own marriage networks, right? So, and this is what we're finding with converts in general, and I'm sure Alex can, can reiterate this. Converts in general, you know, um, I guess, you know, when they came, a lot of them, when they came to Islam, you know, the mosque was proposing as, as, an, as a catch-all solution is that let's get you married, you know, to a, to a Muslim family. So basically, the you know like because a lot of them they fall out with their families you know like uh they don't get the support that they need and they end up turning to a muslim family now i'm not suggesting that that's not a bad idea you know there is there are successful marriages between converts uh and born muslims uh but it's i would say that it's not for everybody um and the reason why i say that is that especially for the sisters um they're placed in a very vulnerable position because again uh, as you know in islam we don't date Right? And they want to follow their religion strictly. And that's normally how you find out if you're compatible with somebody. Um, but at the same time, we don't have a Muslim family to look into potential uh, spouses and screen if you know they're compatible uh, or see if they have all these other problems. And again, uh, and also a lot of uh, convert women, they don't ask for anything for a mahar. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, these converts, especially women, they've gotten taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these marriages end in complete disaster, even if, you know, you have a convert and a born Muslim I've seen personally, where there are two great people, you know, like, uh, you know, the guy was a born Muslim, like his family was great. Uh, and even then uh, it fell apart. Yeah, you know, the, so the stakes are very high. Well, you know, I think that there's one nu nuanced point uh, that happens in that too, which is it's a, it, there's a big difference between uh, a Muslim convert marrying someone who is from overseas, basically, right? Um, who's been living, even if they've been living here for a really long time, but they were born in, in a foreign country and then came here at some point in their life versus someone who's been here, was born here, or maybe even one or both of his parents were born here and they happen to culturally uh, be originally from uh, Egypt or Pakistan or something. Those two people are gonna be completely different uh, marriage partners for yeah. that convert person. I would say generally that that's a better situation, um, I, you know, and, and again, uh, I'm not suggesting that, you know, converts marry the same converts from the same background sure. uh, in all situations, but I'm saying that we don't even have that option. Yeah. Right. So, you know, like when, you know, like I've been to these marriage, uh, um, matrimonial, um, I guess like, uh, anyone call them dating, uh, events, but, you know, they'll happen at the mosque where you, know, you try to look for a potential spouse and they went there before. And it's like, my dad wants me to marry a Pakistani. My dad wants me to marry a Pakistani. My dad wants me to marry an Arab. My, <laughs> and it's just like, at the end, you're just so frustrated. Like, you know, um, but then you start to realize like they have these networks and for them, again, if it doesn't work out, I, again, this is, you know, it's, it's common in liberal society that like, yeah, like any, anyone, you know, sh should marry, you know, love, 
if you marry someone from another background, if it doesn't work out you, and you're not and you're not Muslim and you're just dating, you can just basically move on to the other person. But for the converts, if it doesn't work out, a lot of the times the I've seen uh, converts Islam, they actually leave the Muslim community and sometimes they end up leaving Islam altogether because they've had such a, a negative uh, experience with it. So again, like I'm not saying that it can't uh, work out between a born Muslim and the, you know, I mean, a convert and a first generation Muslim, but um, what I am saying is that um, if we had a sub community, uh, a lot of people, they're just not ready to marry into another culture. Uh, yeah. We just have, yeah. again, even Muslims from adjacent countries, like I know Muslims who are uh, Somali and they say, I don't want to marry an Ethiopian because the culture is too different. I've seen if even Muslims from the same country who are living in different cities, like we had one marriage yeah. between a, a sister from Nablus and a brother from Gaza. And, you know, on the surface, <laughs> you're not from that crowd, you're thinking, yeah, they're both Palestinian, whatever, it's going to work out. And then, you know, the community, both sides, the both extended family was like, no, 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 don't do this. The culture is way too different. Yeah. Even then it ended in divorce. So, yeah. it, and those cultures are 50 to 90% similar. So if you think that, you know, what makes you think that someone marrying someone from a totally different culture is going to work out as well. And, you know, what I would tell, tell to these, to the, nationalist you know uh right anti-islam right is that your anger towards islam is actually making your situation or your grievances worse because what happens is when we convert to islam right we get so much flack from our family you know they disown us they kick us out they kick it you know they write us out of our will um so yeah we're gonna marry a born muslim you know and then you're you're you know you want us to marry another convert and have to deal with not just an Islamophobic family, but Islamophobic in-laws, Yeah, right? Like I, you know, like my, my one friend who's Italian, he converted to Islam and, you know, he didn't want to marry into, he didn't want to marry another convert basically. And I asked him like, you know, you know, people are, and even born Muslims were like, yeah, you should marry another convert. It'd just be a lot more compatible. And I asked him like, why don't you, why didn't you think about marrying another convert? And he said, basically I have enough Islamophobes up my, up my butt. <laughs> So if they really want to, you know, uh, serve, <laughs> end this problem with demographic or, or die, either people dying out or demographic change. Yeah. Islamophobic. If you're going to be Islamophobic, you're headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see what yeah. I mean? So again, it's a very controversial subject. And, I'm, and again, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, converts from the same background should all marry each other. But what I am saying is that the more the people embrace Islam as a community, yeah. Uh, the more their culture stays together. Let me just uh, throw something out there that has nothing to do with, you know, this topic in particular, but it does have to do with the marriage element of things. Uh, when you reflect on Allah saying in Surah Ar-Rum, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, wa min ayatihi, from his signs, mm. and ja'ala, that he placed, baynakum mawadda wa rahma, uh, you know, uh, love and, and compassion. One of the beliefs, the theolog like a, a belief on this issue is that the more people themselves, two people try to make their marriage work, the more they're going down the wrong route. Rather, mm. Allah says it's one of his signs. Mm. And if it's something is described in the Quran as his signs, that means it's something you can't do right yourselves. So there needs to actually be, in general, for everyone, for born Muslim converts, everyone, there needs to be a constant understanding that uh, when a husband and wife get together, Muslim husband and wife are getting along, that is one of the miracles of Allah, mm. right? Whether, regardless of same culture, different culture, right? It doesn't matter. It's one of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can ask that Allah continues it. And if you take your eye off of it, you could lose it, right? But that's an important part for everyone who goes about marriage and maybe someone's in their 20th year of marriage and they're like, uh, you know, they're going through some weird funk in their head and they're like, oh man, I could have done better and I want to do better, et cetera. And because you do hear that a lot, it's almost like I, something of a midlife crisis for some people. I don't know if that term is even real, but it sounds like it. Uh, malaise. But you have to realize that all you a person has to do is ask for it and Allah will put it there. You just have to ask for it and want it because it is true that, that the tafsir of that ayah is that uh, love and mercy and compassion between husband and wife is something from Allah. It makes mm -hmm. 
don't try to make any sense out of it. It could be stronger in year 50 than year 20, right? Whereas you think it should be boring and, you know, done with. But and it could be some people who are completely opposites, right? In, in everything, in looks, in, in uh, status, in racial background, in social, mm. everything. But it's from Allah, right? And all person. Right. So just that, I think we should talk more about that because that'll simplify matters. That also explains why so many grandparents that, you know, uh, people from the East have, their mar- manner of going about marriage and how they had a 60-year successful and happy marriage was that they saw like a black and white picture of his wife and the mom and dad sitting next to him and saying, it's next week, <laughs> right? Yeah. The marriage is next week. <laughs> and the poor kid saying, okay, oh, by the way, what's her name, right? And, and, they, uh, and they're 60 years. And you're wondering, what the heck happened there? Are yeah. you crazy? It's irrational, but it, love is something that is super rational. It's from Allah. So anyway, mm-hmm. I just wanted to throw that in there for anyone listening, talking about marriage and the seeming like difficulty. But if we look at it from that, and if both parties are headed in their, with their hearts in the right direction, Allah will put it there. Well, so that's just a little side. Doesn't have no, to, I, doesn't mean don't take precautions. And because I said earlier, right? I said that the, the bad we shake. He said take precautions, make cultures similar, which is something though, similar to what you're saying as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we. I want to ask, you know, I want to ask you about kafa and you know, after I'm, I'm done yeah. talking, but uh, uh, you know, it, it, I would say that in general, and uh, marriage is just one of many issues where, um, I guess for those of us who who not only uh, thought that Islam was the truth, but actually joined a Muslim community, yeah. all the ingredients basically have to be right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, you know, like a good family, um, you know, openness, uh, extroversion. You know, like feeling that you can dive right into a totally new community and, and get to know them and everything. Whereas some people, you know, I know many people that, you know, uh, you know, they think that Islam is true and it's something that they would like to follow. It's just that, you know, like it would take such an enormous jump and, and you know, going into a totally different new community. There's just their belief in Islam is, is kind of latent and, and they're just not the kind of states people that we are where we just, yeah. just dive right in. So, I got an idea for you. And I'm sorry, I keep going back to this issue because, um, you know, ideas to me are really they're, they're They need some practical execution. I was just thinking if I were in your place, what I would do is after the COVID thing is over every Friday night at the same exact time at the same exact restaurant, I'll get two, three, four guys who have the same vision of you. Like, let's say from the organization, it's time for Europeans mm-hmm. just eat at the same restaurant. Right. Yeah. Time after time, you invite one guy, invite another guy, right? Mm-hmm. Invite a third guy. And, and you don't even have to talk about Islam. It's mm-hmm. just Muslim guys. How many, how many guys don't have anything to do, right, on a Friday night? They would love to eat out somewhere. And a lot of guys, you know, they're not married. They don't have responsibilities, mm. right? They may be divorced. They may have different situations. Hey, we're just eating, talking. You don't have, we're not have to talk about Islam, right? Mm. And uh, I think that's like an inroad to start meeting new people and sit, eat. You don't want to come back. Don't come back. You want to come back. We're here every Friday, seven o'clock. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's a great idea. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's basically how, how a lot of these things start, yeah. you know, like, uh, but it has to, it definitely has to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I would definitely uh, be up for that. Um, I think we covered a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about, but there's definitely so many other things that we can uh, try to address. Um, yeah. Well, some of the other topics that I, I just sort of jotted a lot of these things down. Sure, go ahead. Um, so we talked about sub-communities in the West, division or strength. I guess we can dive a little bit into that more mm-hmm. uh, because, and again, like you said, you know, you know what, you have your vision, Rob, you should just do it and not worry about what everybody else thinks. Yeah. But I mean, I, I think, and you're in agreement with me in, in saying that, uh, you know, you know, uh, communities and cultures are different and they have, you know, they sort of bind together and it's not one, all this big one melting pot, but um, some of the, you know, the criticism of this idea comes from the idea that we're all one Muslim community. We should all be united. Yeah. But at some point, like so go to the other extreme where it's like, okay, like we should just get rid of culture altogether and just, just Islam is our only culture. And I think that, is that it, yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the answer to people like that is that's fantastic. Alhamdulillah, start with your family. 
Yeah. Change their diet. Change the way they dress. <laughs> Tell them to not subscribe to the satellite channels from back home. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 and name your kids something from a, a Muslim background that's not your Muslim background. Yeah. So no, no kids named Javid. Yeah. Right. Or whatever it is. I, I, I think we're all in agreement with that. I think, okay. So yeah, I mean, uh, again, we're starting to realize is that again, a lot of this was a reaction to nationalism in the Muslim yeah. world. Uh, you know, they, you know, saw the division. And when they came here to the West, you know, when they saw that different Muslim uh, cultures were opening up their own cultural centers, you know, and their own places and having their own organizations, then they just had this visceral reaction to it. Like, you know, they're going to think that we're not united. But again, I think Muslims are starting to finally see that uh, that's going to, I guess, too much of an extreme. Um, uh, yeah, the mosque, I guess the mosque approach and saying, you know, like the, the one example that I use is, you know, the, I use the phrase ijaza or bust, you know, and saying that a lot of these mosques, the learning curve is just far too steep. And this goes across the board for all converts. And a lot of born Muslims, you know, like first gen and second gen kind of express these sentiments too. And saying that, you know, a lot of the, uh, things that are happening at the mosque is just, it's kind of just high level, even for, people who've been Muslim their entire lives. And you see this too with our families. I mean, I go back to my, you know, uh, my Italian friend, he brought his family, he was able to bring his family to an open house at the mosque where the, you know, like Imam was giving a talk, right? Uh, and he, this talk was what he thought was catered to non-Muslims. But at the end of the speech, he asked his family what he thought. And he said, and they said, I couldn't understand any of it. And the reason though was because even though it was in English, um, most of the terms were in Arabic. You know, there was a lot of Arabic terms that we're familiar with, but the terminology is just so above their heads. Yeah. But at the same time, I guess going forward and looking at a mosque itself, a lot of these times it's to, ch to have to ask them to change uh, the way they do things. is just really beyond our scope. Like there's one mosque in Chatham where it's a Darul Ulum. 99% uh, of the congregants are from a South Asian background. They all wear the topi, they all wear the shalwar kameez. And the women, when you do see a woman like once in a blue moon, they're wearing all black niqabs. And this is in the middle of like an all white neighborhood. <laughs> so like it's the whole, it's like stepping into Karachi, you know. England of, like, is, is, all, England is yeah. like that a lot. Yeah, has a lot of that. So one, uh, and I used to think, why aren't these people changing? You know, like they're in the West, they should change for the West. But really it's just, some of it is just beyond our, our scope. And yeah. I talked to the imam about this, like, you know, like he and he admitted like their culture that we have is totally different uh, from the culture there. And it's just a barrier. So at what point do we say, you know what, instead of trying to change these mosques and, you know, the way that they are, you know, like why not have, you know, our own office space, you know, you know, away from where this mosque is designed for, uh, you know, people from the background of the people, the non-Muslims in that community. Yeah. So, so Rob, you, you wouldn't know this, but locally the the masjid uh the community center that dr shadi is uh is the religious director of is it's it's sort of that concept i think it happened more organically than than planned out in that in in that sense um it's multicultural it's not it's not a it's not geared towards any one ethnicity there's people from convert backgrounds from Arab Pakistani, but the majority of the leadership, if not all of it, is American born. Mm. And everything, everyone speaks English. Yeah. And there is not one culture represented at all in any of the leadership and any of the programming and any of the, I mean, the closest we come to having one uh, uniform culture is the fact that Dr. Shadi is Maliki and he has an <laughs> army of supporters <laughs> 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 who insist on the Maliki method. But other than that, I mean, it's, 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 it's an American experience, right? Yeah. Um, and one in which people from, uh, from the neighborhood or people from uh, the locale will come and not feel like this is completely alien, this is completely, everybody dresses differently. There's not, a, there's not a style, there's not a uniform, there's not a uniform facial hair, it's not a yeah. uniform way of the women covering. Mm. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a much more American experience it's because everybody that's running things and making decisions about things is American. Yeah. Um, regardless of their cultural background. Okay. Um, and I think that that's, that's really helpful. And it's why MBIC is such a big deal, even though it's a small community center in a small Muslim community, yeah. it's, it has a huge reach. Um, and, and I think, I think without people knowing it, I think that this is, this is why.
We have mm-hmm. a great cover program too, mashallah. Yeah, People that run that. that. The way it it's it happened just by itself is uh, that the imam's position, the mic, is 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 Desi in particular the line of Basit, right? <laughs> it's an imam and his son-in-law. No one else touches that mic. The yeah. mosque, the groundskeepers, and the building maintenance is North Africans, right? The uh, education, the classes, is Maliki. Because me and uh, Ali and Harun, right, uh, who who cover, we are all that's uh, we're all medic. The social programming and the community outreach is white. Well, mm-hmm. half white, half Bosnian, right? Well, one hundred percent white. One hundred percent white. Like half European, American, European, half right? Bosnian. Exactly. Just as a, right. just as an aside, I mean, I try not to use white as much as possible. I mean, yeah. uh, when you look at you know European peoples, you know. You know, like you look at Spaniards and, and Portuguese, you know, they're darker than, than many Arabs. But it's it's inevitable that it's you're gonna use yeah. that term. I mean, Bosnians are some of I think I one time Sam Academic told me statistically the blondest people uh on earth are the Bosnians, right? You won't find a like a, a brown or black haired Bosnian. He told me this one time. And the Serbs are the opposite. They're darker haired features, right? And yeah. in that case, the Serbs, the darker hairs were or mutilating the 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 the, the lighter right feature. So. Yeah, I mean, I've I've created several uh, memes about that. Uh, yeah. Pretty some pretty edgy memes. Yeah. That I can here, but you can look at them <laughs> on my Twitter feed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that destroys the 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 arguments of the uh, the anti-Islam uh, white nationalists. The think thing that- is, yeah, the thing is, <laughs> at the end of the day, if we were to if we were all to be one people again, right? Mm. This is about belief. Before the at the time of the Prophet Nuh, they were all one people. Allah yeah. tells us in the Quran, you are one people. We are one skin, one language, etc. You go to Egypt, they don't differentiate between your your thing. They differentiate if you're religious. Some people hate you, period. Mm, right? Yeah. No matter what you are, what you, and they're all Egyptian. And Pakistan is the same thing. So even if we were to get over all the cultural problems, okay, if people's hearts are not with the deen. They will find, you know, reason to be animo- uh, absolutely have animosity. No, I completely agree with you, and uh, you know that that's you know it's important to uh, keep our in- my intentions pure, yeah. you know, and, and all the people in my group, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, like Islam is the most important thing, um, you know, and uh, you know we we always want to keep that at the at the forefront, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we're in the in, right in the playing field. It, it's very. You know, it's 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 a struggle to uh, you know, like uh, <laughs> uh, you know, not. Um, I guess I don't want to get caught in anything here, but uh, yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, Dean is the most important thing, and uh, you know, the great thing about Islam is that uh, you know, even if you take people or two groups of people who absolutely hated each other, right, and they and those groups of people convert to Islam, you know, like uh, it, it, that's not going to be a. a an instant fix still. I mean, there's still going to be, you know, lingering animosities there, yep. but now you're in a totally different situation. Once you become Muslim is that you're trying to avoid hell and get into paradise. Yeah. Right. And you also want your brothers and sisters to avoid hell and get into paradise because they're going to pray for you and yeah. you're going to pray for them. And uh, Allah is going to judge all of us uh, fairly. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, if, if to think that you're actually, you know, better than, than this group of people, mm-hmm. I mean, you're only hurting yourself at the at the yeah. end of the day. Question. Do you go into the prisons and give Dawah there? I've never been to a prison. No. I mean, uh, even before COVID, I guess me like I'm, I'm uh, I guess I'm kind of a, I'm not the, the strongest in terms of like going into bad environs. Um, you know, I guess it's not really my 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 history. Um, so no, I've never been to a prison uh, to give dawah. Um, that'd be a tough sell, it would very be very tough, very tough. Yeah, but I mean, it, like, talk about to, so when people convert on the outside and have cultural issues and they have family rejection, that's tough, that's really difficult. Yeah, if if you get rejected from your racial group in prison, that's that's the end of you. Yeah, it is. It's not, it's not if you if you had to associate with you know either uh, the black group or um, the Hispanic group or the or the white group, and now you're out because you converted to Islam. Well, that's you just took your shahada and you became shahid at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, I mean, like I said, uh, the there, there's a it's very bizarre to see, but there is a growing group of you know 
uh, Europeans on the far right who are um, very pro-Muslim, mm. uh, believe it or not. And it's, 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 it's very bizarre to see, but um, they refer back to the, I mean, they're big on tra the traditionalists, which I kind of see as like a stepping stone to, you know, uh, you know, real uh, Islam, Islamic beliefs, because some of their beliefs are outside Islam. So it's kind of like, I think it was like an NOI for Europeans, basically. So <laughs> you know, these are far right intellectuals. Yeah. So there's not like the uh, MAGA crowd. No, I mean, these are very anti-MAGA. I mean, I, I don't think I've met any of them or who are pro-MAGA. They absolutely hate Trump. Because they're, so these are like intellectuals, professionals, white collar. Yeah, they voted uh, either for Biden uh, or they didn't vote at all. Okay. Uh, they saw that uh, Trump, you know, basically sold them out, yeah. uh, you know, sold them this platform in 2016, you know, where they think that they were going to be, the Trump was going to represent them. And then, uh, you know, once the, you know, the, the riots started happening last year, um, he, he didn't respond to any police basically let you know the, the cities burn to the ground and you know you can see they uh they basically canceled all of these uh anti-islam alt-right um uh you know like uh, youtubers <laughs> you know they just dumped yeah. them on the side of the road yeah. <laughs> you know like so, so, when you say traditionalists uh you're talking about like the guy eden yeah renee Gunal, renee yeah. Gunal, Frith -Frith Shuan. what's I their saw, attraction to that uh you know, they, you know, like their the traditionalism, you know, they see they were Europeans uh, who saw like that, the that uh, liberalism and the industrial revolution uh, basically destroyed Western society, destroyed the soul of it, basically. Um, if you can read if, a great book to read on it is um, Rene Ganon's, um, oh, what's the name of it? Oh my gosh, subhanAllah, I forgot the name. It's on my <laughs> bookshelf. Uh, I'll be back in, oh, I need to look it up. Sure. Talking about modern, um, uh, I, I know, I know which, I, I know which reference, I know what you're reference. It's the book where he discusses modernism, right? And yeah, he discusses modernism. Um, yeah, I'll be right back in one the, minute. It's there's probably him. nobody better than him on it. I'll be right back in 30 sure. seconds. You guys sure, talk amongst yourselves. I'll get okay. it. No problem. No problem. Right. Yeah. So, Sheikh, yeah, the yeah. the perennialists. There's almost nobody that has a better critique of modernism. Oh, their critique is the best. Yeah, their 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 critique of modernity and modernism and liberalism and. Uh, there it is. Let's see. The crisis of the modern world. That's okay. the name of the book. So, yeah, so if you want to go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically the, the, the core. And they say that, uh, you know, the West lost its soul, uh, you know, was basically in the industrial revolution, you know, just it's it brushed aside religion, uh, it, it brushed aside a sense of uh, eternal importance. And it was basically, you know, the, the West was just basically dying out. And that's why, you know, uh, the traditionalists looked toward the East uh, because, you know, they saw that, uh, that Christianity was not the, the solution and that it was causing so much division and, and, and violence uh, that they needed an alternative. And you can see this also with European philosophers who were pro-Muslim as well. They said positive things about Islam. Yeah. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche, talked about yeah, that uh, yeah you know so he talked about how christianity you know ruined uh europe basically uh and then he was calling for for peace uh peace with islam um you can also um um goethe actually there is some reports that he actually converted to islam uh you know so you know they and that's what they see and, and you know and even Rene Gano, like he gave Dawa, like you know, sent all these letters to Europeans. I think like many of them converted to Islam as well. Um, so that's part of the angle. Um, I actually saw like some someone on the far right who was pro-Muslim made a rap about uh, Rene Gano, like him really? arguing on Twitter with like anti-Islam people. Well, <laughs> one of the reasons that I tell Muslims that don't, uh, mainly Arabs and Desi Muslims, don't jump up on this phrase of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and want to be lumped into that because it's because of the the cracks and the flaws in those two theologies of Judaism and Christianity that led to atheism, right? Mm -hmm. We want to be as far away from that as possible to show we have something different, right? It does not lead to atheism as, you know, this thing led to loss of religion, right? So you got two groups that failed, when yeah. you were given the chance, you failed. Why would you want to link up with that with them? That's so. I get it from the from a certain perspective that you want to you know put that list together. 
but from from a higher perspective that that if you look at any average guys like i'm not christianity is something that's that you lost right judaism lost you know religion in general lost mm-hmm. so why would you want to lump up and team up with that so that's the first point you know second thing i wanted to ask who are some of the leaders in this group <laughs> you're gonna get me canceled <laughs> <laughs> why would you get canceled i mean that's just their i mean no, maybe uh, they have other things maybe they have other things okay so the the you know? anti so you can divide this into the anti-islam pro maga well sometimes they're not exact well i guess you can call them the pro maga types so yeah. on that side you have your youtubers like milo yiannopoulos stefan molyneux um i mean ben shapiro um and again a lot of them then you within that strain there's also like you just focus specifically on on uh you know on the on criticizing islam like a lot of them are ex-muslims like you have your yasmin muhammad uh ayan hirsi ali um tommy robinson is another example of that so that's we have on the anti-islam right the ones who are more i guess neutral uh maybe even uh see the virtues in islam are um, richard spencer keith woods uh edward dutton um who else? Tyler Hamilton. Um, and you know, just to clarify, Richard Spencer, not Robert Spencer. No, yeah, exactly. Very different. <laughs> Robert Tell Spencer me. is an anti-Islam yeah. specialist. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, uh, again, these guys are getting canceled left and right. I mean, uh, so it's 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 very difficult to be able to con- converse with them. And uh, and again, even if, if we were to on Islam for Europeans, we I mean, I mean, we would be canceled in a heartbeat. So. Um, this has to be, it will have to be done very carefully. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that we would be able to be the best people for it. Um, right. And that's why we're collaborating with, with other, you know, groups from first and second gen uh, Muslims who have their own podcasts. Yeah. Um, because again, we're not going to agree on everything and they're willing to talk to others. Oh, you but, mean, um, you mean literally deep platforms when you say can't. Oh yeah. These guys are getting deep platform oh. left and right. I thought you meant yeah, not just criticized. Like no, they're, they're, silenced. Yeah. Like I thought you meant just you know Muslims will be, will be will be attacking, calling you names. I didn't realize that you meant actually like deep platform. Oh yeah, like uh, the, the 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 big tech is going really going after these guys, um, and uh, yeah, I mean even you know you look at historically like um, again and and these people are very anti-Zionist as well. So that's that's, why, that's probably a deciding factor. <laughs> Tell me exactly what is, uh, sorry to interrupt. What is Richard Spencer doing these days? How is he paying his bills? What's he up to? I don't know how he's doing it. I haven't, uh, I haven't conversed with him. Um, you know, um, but again, I mean, he gets on CNN once in a while. Um, but again, it, it's not, it's not just about the, you know, the, the figures themselves. It's just about the, the, you know, I guess the people, I mean, they're, you know, uh, some people are going. Some people are going to follow that crowd. The other people are going to follow the the the, the anti-Islam Deus Volt crowd. Um, so it, it's more of a of an overall zeitgeist than opposed yeah. to just one particular person, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if all these people were gone tomorrow, there would still be other people that would that would spring up, and then these conversations would would still go on between them. But, yeah, uh, but, but from a Dawa perspective, you you look at individuals, right? And you look at, you know, what kind of words are coming out of those individuals. And if someone's mm. starting to say something positive, then you look at that one specific individual and you know, talk to them and see yeah. what happens. You know? We were able you to know? get Edward Dutton on the Mad Men Lukes. Uh, we interviewed him about his book. Uh, and again, we didn't have to agree on everything in the book. Um, but he had some, you know, uh, negative things to say about Islam, uh, positive things to say about Islam. Um, but he was looking at it at a perspective that I didn't agree with, you know, I didn't hundred percent agree with the thesis. Um, you know, like for example, his whole thesis was that, you know, Muslims are successful because, uh, they're high in ethnocentrism, but that's because they're doing practices that are, you know, um, reducing intelligence like cousin marriage and things like that. So I didn't agree with the, the premise. And, you know, we made that clear on the Mad Mem Lukes, um, you know, and he said like, you know, for example, and we didn't agree that, you know, for example, waking up for Fajr or not getting enough sleep uh, was, you know, actually factored into reducing intelligence. You know, and Sim, you know, very astutely pointed out, you know, like Muslims don't, they don't wake up for Fajr. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, it, it, but this is like, um, you know, totally there is you have a concept of evidence I mean, what he's talking about, right? You can't no, possibly prove. 
who published you'd this? Have, it, <laughs> again, yeah, it was published by his own, I, his, I his own self, how. right? <laughs> no, no, it, it was published. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, again, it's a, it's. I look at that book as as not an anti-Islam book, but it, it needs yeah. to be a philosophical exercise. You know, like I, I'm sure there are some Muslims on the left who would say, just cancel this guy, cancel the book. You know, like uh, it's it's giving a bad image toward Islam. But yeah, you know, but these are things. That, go ahead. Those people are also go off and support like trans imams. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, some won't. I mean, like I've talked to people, you know, that I know personally who are, you know, they're into political action as Muslims, but they don't agree with those, uh, as, you know, these issues that uh, Muslims are aligning themselves with. Um, and, uh, you know, they, and again, I, I, they, I understand where they're coming from and that, you know, you don't want to, you know, uh, give a platform to people, um, you know, who, who express these other sentiments that are, you know, like um, seen as very radical. Um, but I guess, you know, the, strictly from a safety perspective, I, you know, you know, like, uh, I, I can't interview these guys, yeah. but, uh, you know, Muslims who are first gen, second gen, n- not white. I mean, they may be able to get away with doing it because, mm. you know, like it's, it's not going to seem like be seen as they're creating an alliance. Yeah. Right. So. It's interesting. Cause I didn't, you know, I didn't really follow tabs on, uh, keep tabs on that whole world, you know, of, uh, you know, for, for, I think for most of us, all that group is just one crazy group, right. Or one group that doesn't like us. Uh, and we don't really split you know, or know even the details about them. So it's actually pretty interesting to me to know that there's you know, different groups and- uh, I mean, to be honest, there's, uh, this, is, this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting, I guess, side conversation that we can have, but there's groups within uh, African-Americans, there's groups within uh, Hispanics and really basically every ethnicity that you can think of in America that for racial, ethnic, cultural reasons, dislike Muslims, mm-hmm. besides theological ones, yeah. right? There's, 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 there's a strong anti-immigrant strain in the African-American community. Mm-hmm. And nobody is saying don't do that to black people because um, they may bring anti-immigrant feelings in that, are, that have like a cultural base. Like nobody's, nobody's saying that, right? 100%. So there's, there's no basis for saying it to don't do that to white people. And by the way, they don't say white conservatives or right, white people on the right. People who I've seen on uh, Twitter, which I'm no longer on, alhamdulillah. Mm. I mean, I still have the account, but I don't go on it. I haven't yeah. been on it in a long time. Those people, they actually say like, one of the concerns is that white people are gonna bring their white supremacist ideologies into uh, our spaces as when they convert to Islam. Like, you're the one that's being racist right now. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard my detractors say that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but no, I'm gonna be, no, we're gonna be very clear. I mean, uh, you know, we don't uh, promote, you know, an, an ideology of, of white supremacy. You know, we don't want to rule over uh, non-whites. We don't want to oppress uh, anybody. And if these people from these groups, you know, they're going to try coming into uh, Islam and, you know, we're going to make it uh, very clear. And again, we don't need to explain anything. I mean, in Islam itself, like I said, I mean, you're coming into Islam, uh, you know, like it's, it's a different worldview now. You know, now you realize that there's a purpose to your life. Um, you're going to be called to account by Allah, uh, you know, you know, like uh, how much pride you have in your heart, which should be zero. Uh, you know, you can keep your culture, you know, you can keep everything about you. You know, you can marry someone from the same culture. Uh, but again, I mean, you're by default, you know, like uh, you can't be racist towards other people or think that a law is going to look, uh, going to give you more leeway uh, yeah. than from other backgrounds when you get judged on the day of judgment. So, sure. No, yeah. well, my, my, my real contention is, don't tell me that your concern is that if if white people who are conservative come into Islam, all of a sudden Muslims are going to have a racism problem. Like, go look at your own uncle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, we don't need there's we don't need anybody else to teach us as a community how to be racist, yeah. <laughs> like virulently racist, yeah. like calling people literally calling calling black people slaves to this yeah. day. Yeah. Right. Like, this is we don't need a, we, this. There's there's no lack of uh, racist. Mm-hmm. and cultural supremacy going on in the Muslim community yeah. where we have to worry about white people in the West, which is generally a less racist uh, environment than uh, a lot of the countries where Muslims come from. Yeah. Um, a lot less cultural, uh, culturally uh, culturally narcissistic or chauvinistic yeah. um, than a lot of these Muslim countries. So like, 
don't worry about it. it it will be fine and no matter how many white people come to this land. well i mean I, I don't care about you know the my leftist uh, detractors and stuff uh, i just don't want to get canceled <laughs> I yeah, yeah get i hear you i hear you no <laughs> but uh, no i mean these these guys are you know it's and again you know uh before spencer was david duke and mm -hmm. duke you know he left the clan he went to syria he went to iran uh you know like he made alliances uh with muslim communities and uh you know, like, but again, I mean, people think that he's just an irredeemable person, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, uh, but again, like they see that, you know, Islam has, you know, like, uh, they, they see the, the Izza of it, you know, they see that like, wow, like these people are united, you know, they have strong families, uh, they have strong family values and, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're you know, they, they got some good things uh, going on with them. Um, but, uh, again, I mean, the, it's going to be some of the challenges. I mean, even the people who I think would be our greatest detractors, and I know who are our greatest detractors, uh, which would be Zionists. I mean, theoretically, they should be supporting us as well because, you know, the way that we look at uh, the Bani Israel is that they used to be the best nation. Um, you know, they lost it. Uh, but still, you know, like uh, Allah says that, you know, there's some people in the people of the book where if you give them a whole hoard of gold, they will readily, you know, pay it back to you without any interest. So that includes, you know, some uh, Christians and Jews. And there are Jews who are going to be uh, uh, rightly guided, right? So, you know, that's much more nuanced position that some of these other white nationalists would just straight up hate them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, like... Uh, so I don't know. It, these are very controversial topics, and uh, I don't want you guys to get deplatformed as well. But uh, oh, in theory, I deplatformed myself, so it's fine. <laughs> theor theoretically, theoretically, I mean, even you know the uh, Ben Shapiro crowd, you know, should be supporting us as well. Yeah. <laughs> Oddly enough, yeah. So I think it, that's no. all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Alex, any I, I uh, think, closing statements? Yeah, I think it'd be tough because. Uh, just on an individual level, I, if I was ever in the same room with him, I, I think I'd deck him. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's already been decked. Oh, I, I, you're talking about Ben Shapiro. Okay. Ben yeah. Shapiro, yeah. <laughs> I'm about yeah. Spencer. Yeah. Oh no, no. Uh, Shapiro's going more and more mainstream and less and less exciting though over the over time, right? Like he's on Radio well, 77. I, you know. Yeah. See, the, the other the other issue is getting into these spaces as well. Um, which would be extremely tough because the, the anti-Islam sentiment is so strong. It's tough to wiggle your way in. And a lot of them just won't even have any Muslims on. Like you look at, um, you know, like Sargon of Akkad, like he says a lot of, he has a lot of anti-immigrant uh, stances, but he's never Wait, had a Muslim on. Anti-immigrant. Who, who is this? Is a character or a name? Sargon of Akkad. He's a, he's a YouTuber. Oh, that's his, uh, that's a character name that he gave himself. That's a character name that he gave. I think his real name is Benjamin Owen, but no, he's well, he's well known in the YouTubing community. Okay. Um, you know, like, like these are high profile, uh, you know, like, uh, faces, you know, like your Ben Shapiro's and your, um, you know, like it's going to be almost impossible to be able to, uh, you know, find, uh, find dialogue with them. I mean, even Joe Rogan, I mean, he's had Muslims on before, but the, you know, they don't talk about Islam really. Yeah. Not to talk about Islam. Yeah. No. The only the only practicing like serious Muslim I think he's ever had on is for us. Yeah, and that for was about Habib, the, he's an MMA coach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, we expect and Mike Tyson. Yeah, yeah. He said Tyson had Dave Chappelle. You know, so I mean, um, like uh, Surat al Abbas, Surat Abbas tells us, you're, you're going to have enemies. Don't pay attention to them. Forget them. They don't want to talk. Don't talk. But there's going to be some people who are open, and that's who we have to find whose sure. yeah. you know heart is and mind is and 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 attitude we can tell is open to discuss and that if that person is the least influential doesn't make a difference that's who we're looking for and that's who's going to give us the energy to keep going right mm -hmm. uh, to look at those types of people who are you know they want to talk and anytime yeah. i go to a crowd or a, a masjid or anything or in a room i i only look at who wants to talk and who is having a favorable attitude to, to me and i give give them my attention you create energy like that you create momentum yeah there's haters over there nothing i could do about that so why even bother bother with it and uh, you expect it actually the more haters that means islam is doing something right because mm -hmm. like uh what's what's his name um what's his mr october i can't remember uh his name for the yankees reggie jackson, reggie jackson? Reg, i think it was reggie jackson when some yeah. kid got booed from the yankees or they got, he got booed right 
He said, well, in New York, they don't boo nobody, right? They're booing you because you're somebody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right? He That's got great. booed and he That's said fantastic. that. Right. He, they're only booing you because you're somebody not going to boo some no, nobody. Mashallah. So that's good to see that you have haters. You have to have some haters. So, but we got to look at our energy and get uh, something going, some momentum going uh, with people who are who are open, and that's all we have to, should think about, you know. And that's all we got to keep yeah, going. And I'm, and Sheikh, you know, we've said this n- numerous times on this podcast that the conser- the white conservative, or even just the conservative Western uh, non-Muslim, is ripe for dawa it is a, a really important area that's often overlooked and if people don't pay attention to that you're missing out on people who have a natural disposition yeah. to a lot of the things that islam brings yeah. you know, all you have to do is just open up the door mm-hmm. yeah so, i mean alhamdulillah you're doing that some of that work yeah inshallah but uh, again i mean like you said like uh, yeah you're gonna get haters but uh, and, and in every crowd i mean and I could see, you know, the people, the Muslims who don't feel comfortable with these people, you know, like uh, have a lot of resentment towards them. It's understandable, like I said, and I'm not here to say, you know, like uh, try to convince them uh, that uh, that, you know, like there are people out there that, you know, like uh, who don't hate Muslims, uh, you know, who are on our side or at least neutral about it. Um you know, again, I mean, uh, I can't convince them otherwise. And I understand where they're coming from. You know, I haven't lived their experience. I'm not a visible Muslim. Um, but uh, again, that's why our mandate is different. Our mandate is to, you know, we have an end with these people. Uh, so it's our responsibility uh, to, to to give dawah to, yeah. uh, to them. So. I mean, Allah, Allah give you the tawfiq. And, yeah. um, you know, thank you for coming on. It's uh, you having important. Me. You know, important. I, I love talking about Dawa and seeing what's going on and, and what's happening uh, in different, you know, seg- segments of Dawa. And that's what we're, Safina Saadi is all about. And that's what we want to keep doing. And so hopefully in the future, we'll have you back on and, and hear about the progress and the stories that you got. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, if you want to have one of these guys on, I mean, uh, <laughs> you're in the, that I don't feel comfortable. Well, I mean, I already got a guy for that. I mean, I got, we got, I got Maheen and Mad Mem Lukes, you know, they're willing yeah. to. I'm willing to talk to anybody who wants to talk about Islam, you know, and I don't debate. I just, you at bring up a topic. I'll tell you what, what Sharia says about it, what our theology says about it. And I, sometimes you have to have a confrontation, but in general, when it's actually face to face, I don't want to be confrontational. I just want to talk. Right. Well, like if you have someone, um, you know, I'm willing to have him on, you know, that type of person, if he's interested in learning what the Dean says. I have well, what, what the, yeah, what are the, I guess, one of the things I'm posing to you now is, you know, you have the religious knowledge and for religious uh, Muslims, you know, who have like the, who, who done their education, who know, you know, like uh, the Quran and Hadith, you know, like uh, very well, I guess the challenge is now uh, getting that information out there and disseminating that information to the general public, yeah. because, um, you know, a lot of the times they get frustrated because they'll say, you know, like we're trying to give this information out, for example, female genital mutilation you know like uh you know we keep saying you know this is what islam says about this uh you know and give a good big comprehensive answer but to the general lay you know the muslim laity like us who don't have as much education uh it's tough we need something that we can refer them to quite easily and quickly uh you know and that's why i think that's going to be one of the big challenges because you know there's so much uh anti you know, misconceptions about Islam that are really out there. And if you read D- Dutton's book, you know, like he probably got that information from Ayan Hirsi Ali and all the people who have all that media attention. Yeah. So the challenge is going to be getting that information to us who are actually talking to them and also um, having it available at the click of a button to, uh, to um, you know, just for our own information. Look, if any of these guys who wants to, to learn, right, I'll talk to them. It doesn't have to be on a podcast. It could be podcasts. I don't mind. Yeah. Right. But if they want to actually know what's going on, I'd love to talk to them. And okay. Alex will talk, come will be on. And, and if we, whether you're making a podcast, yeah. don't, yeah. doesn't make a difference to me. But if he wants to I argue, just, no. Yeah. I just have to say one thing about the point that Rob brought up, which is, yeah. is it's an important point. And I think that resources like that are useful and valuable and needed. Um, but one of the things that I've learned over my time as a Muslim and working with Dawah organizations is that when it comes down to discussing fiqh with uh, people that are interested in Islam or people that are antithetical to Islam, 
think you can go back and forth forever and never make any progress whatsoever yeah. and change anything. The best, the best dawah is, all right, do you believe in God or no? Let's get over your atheism. If once we get over that, okay, you believe in God. Yeah. Let's talk. What's the best monotheism? Okay, good. We don't believe in idols. We don't believe in multiple gods. Now that we're a monotheism, what's the best expression of it? And of course, it's much more detailed than that, but it has to go through belief first yeah. long before you get to fiqh. Because when you get, when it gets to points of fiqh, Allah, unless you're a Muslim with strong iman, there's things that you'll never get over. Like if you need to be comfortable with all of the rulings of yeah. the religion before you convert, mm. you'll never convert. It's the complete wrong. At some point, it's something's going to bother you. Exactly. It's the, it's the wrong starting point. The starting point is, is the source even true or false, right? Is the prophet true or false? That's the real question. Yeah. Right? That's the real question. And, and once you have that, once you establish proofs from, from whatever kind of logical arguments you, you use to arrive at whether it's Kalam cosmological theory or whatever once you arrive at the fact that this is true and this is a real religion and this is a messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after that you just you have to accept anything that comes right grow a beard shave your shave your head doesn't matter right those yeah. are just those yeah. are ancillary to the core issue it was a great lesson i remember from uh, dr omar actually uh, farooq abdullah uh, he was in a medical appointment and one of the workers there said, you know, I'm actually this close to entering Islam. And lo and behold, you're here. He's like, well, what's holding you back? He said, I, I drink, right? So you believe what he said? He said, so drink, right? <laughs> he said, uh, he said, wait, <laughs> but it's haram, right? He knew the word haram. He says, haram. He said, yes, yeah, haram. Doesn't mean you can't be a Muslim and commit haram. You don't think all Muslims commit haram. So you believe it's wrong. Deal with it later has nothing to do with you entering Islam or not. So this poor guy thinking, oh, I got to make sure I'm not an alcoholic. I don't drink anymore before entering Islam, right? And he said, no, you don't let that be a barrier. All you have to know to enter Islam or not is, is God true? Is the Prophet Muhammad true, right? That's it. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. One, yeah. And the guy took shahada on the spot. Right? Yeah. Literally in that conversation, he took shahada. And he probably gave up drinking really soon. Yeah, because once the iman comes in, right, you become stronger willed. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, I guess the most, one of the, yeah, exactly. One of the most important things to know when you, you know, when talking to people who are close to converting to Islam or just converted to Islam is that, you know, like, um, you know, no matter what sins you commit, you know, you're still a Muslim, you know, there's always a chance for repentance, you know, like, uh, you know, that you, you, you have a chance to, to pray five times a day. And it's like taking a, a bath every day, you know? Uh, yeah. So there's always that opportunity, you know, to, to have your sins forgiven. Um, so, you know, if they don't understand that facet, uh, you know, a lot of them are going to, you know, uh, drop off very quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. so All right. Right. I'll just say one last thing before, mm -hmm. uh, before we sign off, anybody watching this, the, the hat and the shawl, I'm not abandoning my, my uh, Spanish <laughs> culture. It's just cold in my house. It's, we had a major blizzard. What yeah. what for Canadians is probably like a dusting. I know, I know. We got, <laughs> we got like it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did I don't uh, you, you get storms this year, Robert? Yeah, a few. Yeah, London's in the snow belt. So okay, we're, that's good. Yeah, we're in the direction of Buffalo. So uh, oh we wow, it was snow. Yeah, I, so. I I love the snow, and we got two feet today. So. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Jazakum Allah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Wa al-'as. Inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladina amanu wa amilu s-salihat. Wa tawasu bil-haq. Wa tawasu bil-sabr. Wa s-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam wa Muhammad Mustafa, Subhi wa fil masafi tarqil awla